Welcome to Berlin. No sooner, uh, I'm Susan Nyman, by the way, director of the Einstein Forum. No sooner was this conference announced than it was greeted with a sprinkling of Twitter attacks. The topic allowed the attackers was interesting, but the conference was suspicious since it was conceived by Emily Disha Becker, Susan Nyman, and Stephanie Schuler Springorum, all of whom were. I'm quoting Twitter, essentially involved in the Weltoffenheit initiative. Mea culpa. The three of us met through the initiative and quickly discovered we were thinking on similar lines. For those of you who haven't followed the German debates of the past year and a half, Weltoffenheit, inadequately translated as cosmopolitanism, was an initiative of 32 German cultural institutions ranging from some of the largest, like the Haus der Kulturen der Welt, to some of the smallest, like the Einstein Forum. We came together to protest the use of the BDS resolution, a 2019 parliamentary resolution which forbade giving a platform in state-sponsored institutions to anyone suspected of sympathy for BDS. This is one of the nicer things about Germany is the large amount of state funding for culture, almost every cultural or intellectual institution received some, this amounted to a virtual ban on anyone who was sympathetic to BDS, where sympathy was left very vague and could amount to any expression of fundamental criticism of the Israeli government or support for Palestinian civil rights. When we came together in 2020, the resolution had already been used to force the resignation of the Berlin Jewish Museum's director, Peter Schaefer, and was being offered as a reason to disinvite the Cameroonian cultural theorist, Ashim Membe, from a scheduled keynote at a prominent festival. Cancellation of a project by an Israeli art student and other instances would soon follow. I frankly thought our initiative was going to be a tempest in a teapot. It was a matter of freedom of speech and association, and given the prominence of many of the organizations, I thought the issue would disappear overnight. And it is a free speech question. Just a week after we announced our initiative, the parliament's own legal investigation pronounced any implementation of the resolution to be in unconstitutional. Henceforth, it would be treated as a political opinion without the status of law. Nonetheless, and despite several civil court cases, <clears throat> it's still regularly invoked to exclude authors from publications, artists from exhibits, and speakers from stages. We were all astonished by the force and the tone of the public reaction. For most of the media and many politicians, objecting to the use of the resolution to stifle discussion was equivalent to support for BDS, which was in turn equivalent to anti-Semitism. Weltoffenheit equals BDS equals anti-Semitism became a trope which was applied without shame even to those of us who are Jewish. For the Americans in the audience, think APAC on steroids. So what's behind the violence of the objections and this in a country where most people had never heard of BDS before 2020? A little research turned up an interesting fact. Two versions of a resolution to ban BDS supporters from the public sphere were doing the rounds beforehand. One by the then oppositional FDP party, which at the time was flirting with right-wing populist discourse, and a second one by the AfD, Germany's new far-right party. They had learned the lesson, likely from Steve Bannon, with whom they regularly meet, that you can get away with right-wing racist policies as long as you swear eternal fealty to the government of Israel. So the AfD introduced a parliamentary resolution that would ban any organization sympathetic to BDS in order to undermine the justified suspicion that the AfD's policies are perilously close to neo-Nazism. Now this put the coalition parties in a bind. First of all, they knew that this version of the re resolution would surely be an unconstitutional, and second, they were loath to cooperate with the AfD on anything. But how could they let themselves be seen as less philo-Semitic than the right-wing opposition? 16 days after the AfD introduced its resolution, the other parties came up with a slightly weaker version, which still stands. Now, all of this is public knowledge. It's available on the parliament's own website. But there's been no public discussion of it, nor raising of the question, qui bono? 
Why do right-wing nationalist parties regularly invoke the memory of the Holocaust and the threat of anti-Semitism while open racism towards groups other than Jews remains an integral part of their program? Americans saw this consistently during the Trump presidency, but it is an international problem. Before February 24th, we had already invited a human rights expert from Moscow to discuss Putin's abuse of the great patriotic war for nationalist purposes, but none of us imagined he would be so cynical as to launch a war of aggression with the claim that Ukraine should be denazified. And just last week, an Indian colleague informed us that a congressman of India's far-right BJP party called the Muslim conquest of India the bloodiest chapter in the history of the world and came close to equating it with the Holocaust. This international problem has never yet been discussed from an international perspective, and by doing so in this conference, Emily, Stephanie, and I hope to move from defensive arguments over who is and who isn't anti-Semitic to a deeper and more fruitful discussion. How is the accusation of anti-Semitism used, and what can we do about its abuse? If this is an international problem, it's particularly acute and complex in Germany. For inventing the concept Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, historical reckoning, Germany became the first nation in the world to make examining past crimes an integral part of national identity. This was neither automatic nor immediate. Like any other country, Germany preferred to see its history in heroic terms. And when that becomes impossible, nations turn to a narrative of victimhood. Astoundingly, for outsiders, this narrative dominated West German discourse for the first 40 years after the war. We lost the war and millions of lives and surrendered territory. The country was divided, the cities were in ruins, and on top of it all, the occupying allies insisted the war was our fault. For the Americans in the audience, it's really like the discourse of the lost cause people. The predominant West German self-image was, we are history's victims. Slowly, and often unwillingly, Germany moved from that perspective to seeing itself centrally as a perpetrator. Despite its many failures, this process of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung was historically unique and deserves recognition. No other nation did anything like it, though the US is currently undergoing something similar. And indeed, in my book, Learning from the Germans, I argued that some elements of that process should serve as models for other countries that have been much slower to recognize their own historical crimes. The US, Britain, Spain, Holland, and France, for a start, come to mind. Unfortunately, in the last two years, the German process has gone haywire leading to a situation in which Germans of all political stripes regularly accuse left-leaning Jews of anti-Semitism or ask Israelis to take account of German sensibilities before criticizing their own government. It's a situation that's almost funny, except when it's not. What most Germans know about Jews, they were our victims. And the shame of that knowledge is so great that it often closes the door on ordinary knowledge of Jews, Israel, or Palestine. Germany's relation to Israel is not unlike its relation to Russia. Focused on its guilt for past crimes against Jews and citizens of the Soviet Union, it's often been, able to, been unable to look closely at what's going on in both countries in the present. Of course, there are politicians and business people who have profited from close ties to Russia, and we all know their names. But there are many others whose desire to see Russia in the best possible light wasn't motivated by greed, but by the honest desire to atone for the German past. Better not think of the Russian present. The Germans in this audience will remember President Steinmeier's moving speech commemorating the German invasion of the Soviet Union just one year ago. And similarly with Israel. Shame about the crimes of Germans' parents and grandparents looms so large that the whole territory is mined. Best not to look at what's happening in the occupied territory of Palestine. The controversy has also been framed in ways that are highly problematic and completely unnecessary. One angle in the media has been to frame it as a conflict between Jews and people of color. How can one possibly address both racism and anti-Semitism? 
First of all, the question ignores the fact that there are Jews of color, not a few, um, and some are among us in this conference. Even more, this sort of framing betrays complete ignorance of universalist traditions in Judaism going back to the book of Exodus. Because we were strangers in the land of Egypt, we have special responsibilities to those who are strangers or minorities anywhere. Besides the universalist tradition, there is, of course, a nationalist tradition in Judaism. It focuses on the ways in which Jews have been victimized by majorities throughout history and insists that, therefore, Jews must focus <clears throat> solely on Jewish safety and sovereignty. The two traditions are in perpetual negotiation, if not in conflict. But it's been surprising to see how many Germans are unaware of the universalist tradition at all, especially since so many of the great Jewish thinkers they celebrate were clearly a part of it. Albert Einstein and Hannah Arendt were only the most prominent of those who warned that an Israeli state which did not ensure equal rights for its Arab citizens would be doomed to fail. To be called an anti-Semite is the worst thing that can happen to a German, said one German scholar to me. I'm not exactly wild about being called a self-hating Jew, but I do get it. The fear of being called anti-Semitic makes Germans particularly vulnerable to the Israeli government's decided efforts to weaponize the term. You'll hear about that weaponization in two of tomorrow's lectures. I suspect no Jew anywhere will doubt the reality and the danger of anti-Semitism, and certainly any Jew who's lived in Germany will have experienced soft versions of it and occasionally hard ones. But we're convinced that the instrumentalization of the accusation of anti-Semitism for nationalist purposes, cynically deployed to attack migrant and progressive movements and silence Jewish and Palestinian voices is a danger for in itself also for us, proud diasporic Jews, whose safety is rooted in solidarity and equality. At least one blog has already called this conference anti-Israel. I reject the framing of these questions as pro or anti-Israel, as if it were a matter of your favorite football team. Not only are many of us here Israelis, like millions of Jews and Israelis around the world, we fear that Israel's present course is profoundly self-destructive and that stigmatizing those who criticize that course as anti-Semitic will ultimately create more anti-Semitism. Just a couple of um, organizational notes. We don't do long flowery introductions uh, or even short flowery introductions. This is what your program is for. If you don't have one, you can pick it up outside. We will introduce all of our speakers by name. If you want to read what else they've done with their lives and where they come from, it's all here. Okay. Um, there's simultaneous translation into English and German, uh, headsets available outside, questions can be posed in both languages. Unfortunately, we have had three con cancellations due to a combination of uh, health and visa problems. Uh, let's see, have we, yeah, um, unfortunately, Ukrainian historian Yohanan Petrovsky Stern will not be joining us, uh, nor will Ale uh, Belarus, a uh, Belarusian uh, historian Alexander Friedman, nor will, um, wait, I've got to get all, we had three cancellations, I've got to get them all, nor will the uh, Palestinian filmmaker Suhad Baba be able to join us uh, for the um, European premiere of her film, COVID. Some of you know we were originally planning to do this in February, um, but at least we've managed to get most people here now. Uh, questions in both languages. We also have plenty of food. Um, in addition to the two kiosks run by the uh, Haus der Kultur der Welt, one is outside on the roof, one is downstairs near the restaurant. Tomorrow we will also have a food truck uh, for the following three days offering excellent homemade pierogies with meat, without meat, and vegan. Um, we've invited a range of speakers who will not always agree with us or each other, and we expect this 
conference to be controversial. We welcome intense exchanges in the hope that an honest and open discussion of these questions will lead to less anti-Semitism and racism. We welcome you to this conference. Um, a warm welcome also from my side. It's true we don't do flowery introductions, but we will speak here, the three of us, and we will get shorter while the time moves on, so don't worry. Um, my name is Stefanie schuler spring -Gohm. I'm the director of the Center for Research on Anti-Semitism here in Berlin. And this center, founded almost to the date 40 years ago, was the first and for some time the only academic institution in Germany, East and West, that dealt with the history of anti-Semitism in general and with the mass murder of European Jewry in particular. Its founding fathers, the head of the then head of the Berlin Jewish community and later of the Zentralrat, Heinz Galinsky, and the historian Reinhard Rürup perceived those two fields, anti-Semitism and Holocaust research, as inseparably linked. And in the 1990s, under my predecessor Wolfgang Benz, the Center for Research on Anti-Semitism de facto became the first German Holocaust research center, with special focus on the voices of the victims, by the way. At the same time, however, those two fields, anti-Semitism and Holocaust history, developed into rather disconnected units in the international and later also in the German academic world, and have stayed so ever since. Today, however, we are witnessing an uncanny new relationship between those two terms, where at least in the public arena, the awareness against anti-Semitism and the commemoration of the Holocaust have produced an unprecedented set of allies. This new relationship is the reason for this conference, as Susan has just pointed out. My task here now is to explain, especially, especially to all non-Germans in the room, but, or in the hall, um, but maybe also to some Germans, the historical development of the rather unsettling contemporary German discourse on these topics that Susan already started to point out to and that some of you might have followed by reading the contributions to what already is called the second Historica Streit historians debate. The development of the specific German Vergangenheitsbewältigung reckoning, you just may name so not coming to terms with, but reckoning whatever, Vergangenheitsbewältigung has lately been recounted in different variations and with different emphasis. From the vantage point of the early 2020s, it becomes obvious that it was especially in the 1990s in the re-established German unified state that not at least under international pressure, intense debates on the character of German and other crimes took place. And those discussions always included the question of how to situate the mass murder of European Jewry within this array of atrocities. However, and this is always forgotten, at the same time, the slogan of the two dictatorships on German soil emerged in German public discourse portraying Nazi Germany, the GDR, and their respective crimes as not only similar, but rather equal by the term the two German dictatorships. This questions the results of the first historian's debate of the, 19, of the late 1980s, which had established the Holocaust as unique, unprecedented, and not connected to the politics and crimes at that time of the Soviet Union after 1917. Hence, the debates focused on the extent and uniqueness of German perpetratorship and the acknowledgement of a collective German guilt and or need for a German shame about the Holocaust and their meaning for German identity and national memory. Contesting and supporting a national hubris of unification, these debates stood at the center of how the new Berlin Republic would view, understand, and present itself, and we will hear more about this in the coming days. Interestingly enough, neither the exhibition on the War of Annihilation against the Soviet Union in 1991 by the Foundation Topography of Terror, nor the more famous and Wehrmachtsausstellung on more or less the same topic four years later, imbued discussions on the character of the German colonial project in the East and its millions of victims of civilian victims beyond the Jews. We should not forget the bitter protest against the Wehrmacht-Ausstellung in the mid-1990s, for example, 
And this Ausstellung by documenting war crimes of the German army hit the core of German family memories, namely that the army had not been part of the Nazi genocidal enterprise and that thus many Germans could claim that grandpa was no Nazi, as a famous book title went. It took three, almost three more decades and the continuous emphasis on the unprecedented nature and dimension of the Holocaust in order to gain a wide public and social acceptance for its equally unpre unprecedented positioning at the core of German democratic and national identity. The current reluctance among parts of the German political and cultural elite to even discuss, much less accept, comparable aspects of the Holocaust or its relationship and entanglement with other crimes because they are perceived as challenging its singularity, this reluctance might exactly have its root in the long and painful process of accepting it in the first place. Hence, if the moral fundament of the United Germany is based on the collective acknowledgement of, of a supposedly unique mass crime, then any attempt to advance our understanding of the historical event itself through comparison with other German crimes or other genocides can and is being perceived as an attack on the very foundation of this new nation state. And that, as we have seen, receives fierce blowbacks by politicians and media representatives who dedicated their professional life to establish this new identitarian dogma. And let us not forget that the leadership generation of the 1990s and 2000s, up to today more or less, grew up in two different post but post-fascist societies. In the East, where the state emphasized a firm anti-fascist stand, yet by fo focusing on the remembrance of communist resistance against the Nazis, sidelined general knowledge and acceptance of a particular Jewish experience of the Holocaust. And in the West, where the former Nazis were so ubiquitous that the real German miracle seems to be the development of a functioning democracy. In both German states, and this, this produced a collective amnesia of the participation in and responsibility of individual Germans for the atrocities committed, and the cold and often dismissive treatment of the survivors of German crimes after the end of the war. And this was the status quo we should not forget well into the 1980s, and this was what the protagonists of today were fighting against in their use, some of them at least. As pointed out, um, as I've pointed out, the establish, establishment of what we call the unique German Erinnerungskultur, um, mem politics of memory, today did not start until the 1990s, and we tend to forget that it not, did not go uncontested. On the contrary, it found grandiloquent and loud opponents among the elites in the Frankfurter Paulskirche and on the streets alike, and this well into the new millennium. The contemporary impression that this Erinnerungskultur and its basic moral paradigms are firmly rooted in German society probably has to do with this ascent to raison d'etat during the last 15 to 20 years at most, when the German start, state started to fund generously memorial sites, museums, and educational programs, which became then, as we know, a foreign, pol foreign policy expert success, especially in Eastern Europe. But two decades are not a long time, and less so given the rise of a right-wing political party in Germany that while maintaining an alibi, alibi discourse about the dangers of anti-Semitism, we've heard that, on the local and regional level, viciously fights projects and programs dealing with the Nazi past and its lessons. Such, <clears throat> such attacks, on, attacks on the discussion and dissemination of historical knowledge are just one of the dangers that extremist nationalism increasingly poses for democracies, not just in Germany and Europe, but on a global scale. We will hear a lot about this in the following days. But today, I would like us to remember one other historical reason for this new rise of ethnic nationalism, namely the destruction of the once multicultural landscapes in Central and Eastern Europe, first by Stalinist and then Nazi policies of deportation, then by the German colonial war of annihilation in the East, and, <clears throat> and last but not least, by post-war international agreements. It is against this backdrop, the historical emergence of present-day Europe, that we should situate our debates <clears throat> on present-day visions of inclusion and exclusion, commemoration and forgetting. 
At the same time, more or less, um, of the destruction of the old European, Central and Eastern Europe, at the other end of the continent in the West, the German Jewish thinker Walter Benjamin put an end to his life, um, having lost all hopes to survive German persecution. In one of his last works on the concept of history, he reminded us, the future generation, of our task. And I'm quoting him and I'm concluding with this quote. Only that historian will have the gift of fanning the spark of hope from the past who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. And this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. Thank you very much. I'll keep it short. Good afternoon and welcome. Today we're honored to convene so many formidable people to discuss the ways in which remembrance can be weaponized and is being deployed for a liberal means around the globe and specifically also here in Europe. It was our sense that the political dimensions of Holocaust remembrance are best discussed with people informed by its study and invested in maintaining the links between its memory and a universal anti-fascism. These links are under threat today. To stage this conference in Germany is significant, as Germany has been getting a little too giddy as of late about the moral authority it has conferred upon itself as the nation of perpetrator heirs, some of which you have heard in the news and in Susan's introduction. I'm tremendously honored to be part of organizing this event with so many brilliant speakers and attendees, but I also have mixed feelings about assembling so many international guests, many of them Jewish, who might be dragged through the mud of the German discourse for participating in this event. To critically assess the function that Holocaust remembrance and education plays in combating xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and exclusion is no easy task nowadays in this country. But that is also why I am hopeful about the prospect of an intervention. Living in Germany with a Jewish family history, it is almost impossible to think about the Holocaust to mourn without feeling resentment at the reactionary appropriation of it. Discoursing with non-Jewish Germans about these topics sometimes feels a bit like being in a relationship with someone whose big performative feelings constantly crowd out your own. But this isn't a lament about poor taste. The situation is, in fact, dire. In 2017, the neo-fascist AfD party won 14% of the national vote and entered parliament smuggling a combination of Holocaust belittlement, rabble-rousing against immigrants, fig-leaf pro-Israel militancy, and open contempt for cultural Jews along with them. Their power has since dwindled, partially at least because centrist politics have effortlessly picked up so many of their talking points. On a regular basis here in Germany, politicians of all stripes combine rote pronouncements of remembrance with anti-immigrant sentiment paranoid fifth columning and agitation, stoking fears of supposed cultural loss, of rampant criminality, and railing against the way of life of those who refuse to assimilate. These same people insist that the actual continuity between Germany in the 1930s and today is the Palestinian-led boycott of the State of Israel, which is, in the words of a cultural journalist, an updated version of the Nazi boycott of Jews. The BDS resolution passed by parliament calls this comparison between the Nazi German regime and Palestinian civil society an inevitable association. A few months after the passage of the anti-BDS resolution on Yom Kippur, a neo-Nazi gunman attacked a synagogue in the city of Halle. A massacre of Jews was only narrowly averted thanks to the unexpected heftiness of a wooden door. Disappointed, the gunman trained his fire on a nearby kebab store, killing two. The synagogue had received no police protection or assigned security, despite repeated requests by community leaders. Two days earlier, notably more official attention had been devoted to a concert in Munich by German-Israeli klezmer singer Nirit Sommerfeld, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Here, the municipal government dispatched an official observer to ensure that Sommerfeld didn't say anything deemed anti-Semitic during her concert. 
Sommerfeld is a member of Jewish Voice for a Just Peace, which supports BDS. On anniversaries of Nazi crimes, of which we have many, racists line up to spout platitudes. Center-right politicians, such as Christian Lindner, our current Minister of Finance, fearmonger about illegal immigrants one day, and then post selfies of themselves with the sign, hashtag we remember the next. The universalization of Western Holocaust remembrance apparently now grants German politicians the impropriety to memorialize German crimes in internet English. For example, Philipp Amthor, a young Christian Democrat invited on TV to commemorate the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, uses the occasion to say that one must not forget that anti-Semitism is particularly prevalent in Muslim cultures. Later, he poses for a selfie with a neo-Nazi who is wearing a shirt depicting a famous Holocaust denier. Or take the anti-Semitism commissioner of Baden-Württemberg, also a Christian Democrat, who refers to left-wing Jewish groups as so-called Jewish and recently used the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising to commemorate the crimes of German and Arab armies, German and Arab. This form of universalization feels like a further indicator of a convenient externalization. And the convenient externalization gets worse and deadlier when you broaden the picture, moving away from Germany to Poland to Hungary or Russia, as we seek to do here in the coming days. It is only through observing comparatively looking at different national contexts beyond our own front door, that we can begin to comprehend the extent of the problem. Our history, the history of our families and communities destroyed by European fascism and ethno-nationalism has become a most dangerous weapon in the arsenal of the internationalist right. <clears throat> I want to understand it and to fight it. I hope that by assembling you here in the coming days, this will spur something to name a phenomenon to examine it, to question remembrance from a place of investment in it. Thank you. <laughs>